Good afternoon, my name is Ann Chung. I'll be presenting a case from the University of North Carolina. I'd like to thank Sages and our moderators for this opportunity to present. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, this is a case of malrotation in an adult for which we performed a laparoscopic LADS procedure. Sorry. Uh, just a little bit of background. Um, intestinal malrotation is a congenital condition caused by arrest of abnorm uh, normal rotation of the gut during fetal development. In normal development, the primary intestinal loop is pushed out into the area of the yolk stack and begins a normal rotation of the bowel twisting 90 degrees counterclockwise. During weeks eight to 10 of gestation, the loop then returns into the abdomen, and as it returns, there is an additional rotation of 180 degrees counterclockwise. Any interruption of this pathway can lead to an aberrant location of the intestines, formation of LADS bands, and a shortened mesentery. Um, this abnormal anatomy can lead to issues with volvulus and bowel ischemia. There are various anomalies of gut rotation, with the most common types being uh, non-rotation and malrotation. In non-rotation, the primary loop of intestine does not rotate when it returns to the abdominal cavity. Thus, the small bowel is located on the right, the colon is located on the left. Um, there's less risk of volvulus with this type of variation. With malrotation, which is what we, we commonly see um, clinically, um, the duodenal jejunal limb is non-rotated, the cecum is partially rotated and fixed in the upper abdomen um, by LADS bands, and these LADS bands can cross the duodenum and cause extrinsic compression and obstruction of the duodenum. In this situation, these patients tend to present commonly with volvulus. Malrotation is typically diagnosed in childhood, although the incidence of diagnosis in adults is reportedly as high as 40%. Adults tend to have a chronic, indolent course with intermittent colicky abdominal pain and vomiting. It is more common in children to present acutely associated with volvulus. The gold standard for diagnosing malrotation is an upper GI series, but a CT scan is also commonly used. The treatment for intestinal malrotation is a LAS procedure, which can be performed laparoscopically or open. The steps for the procedure are as follows. If there is a volvulus present, then the bowel is rotated counterclockwise. Then the LADS bands that run between the cecum, duodenum, and mesentery are divided. An apodectomy is performed as part of this procedure, and the procedure is completed by placing the small bowel on the right and the colon on the left. Currently, the laparoscopic approach is most commonly undertaken and has been shown to be as safe and effective as a traditional open reproach in both children and adults. Our case is a 54-year-old male who presented to our clinic with a history of chronic intermittent abdominal pain and no prior abdominal surgeries. He underwent a CT scan and was found to have intestinal malrotation with small bowel wall thickening concerning for intermittent volvulus. Given his symptoms and imaging consistent with malrotation, we offered him a laparoscopic LADS procedure. This is his CT scan, just a couple of cuts, and you can see that um, his He's got uh, intestinal marrow and he's got some um, small bowel wall thickening on some of his loops of small bowel. We can go ahead and play the video. So on entrance into the abdomen, we identified the cecum and noted that it was in an abnormal location in the right upper quadrant. It was retracted medially and we began mobilizing the right colon along the white line of tolt towards the hepatic flexure. The appendix is then identified and it's noted to be in a retrocecal location. As we mobilized it to perform our appendectomy, we identified the right ureter lying just lateral to the appendix. We lysed adhesions surrounding the appendix and the psoas muscle was visualized posteriorly. Here the appendix is overlying the inferior vena cava and the duodenum. We then completed our appendectomy and removed the appendix using an endocatch bag. At this point, the right colon was then flipped medially to expose the duodenum. You can see there are adhesions um, or LADS bands from the duodenum to the surrounding retroperitoneum and the colon, as well as inner loop adhesions of the duodenum so causing some kinking of the bowel. These were divided with a combination of blunt and electrocautery dissection. Here again are adhesions to the retroper uh, retroperitoneum, and we have the duodenum, which is overlying the IVC, and we dissected off these adhesions as well.
We then completed the mobilization of the right colon by opening up the gastrocolic ligament at the mid-transverse colon and divided it towards the, toward, proximally towards the hepatic flexure. Once the right colon was completely mobilized, we were able to flip it over medially and we were able to expose the entire um, duodenum as well as the head of the pancreas, which you can see coming up here. There are more adhesions of the duodenum to the mesentery and these were taken down again with a combination of blunt and electrocautery dissection. So this is coming up towards the head of the pancreas. So it was during this adhesiolysis that we identified a fatty band that was adhered to the terminal ileum, overlying the duodenum, causing some obstruction, and we went ahead and divided this. So once the right colon and the duodenum were completely freed from each other, we ran the small bowel proximally towards the ligament of trites. So as we were running the small bowel, we had countered adhesions from the bowel to the root of the mesentery. These were taken um, and divided with electrocautery. And again, this isn't a patient who has had no prior abdominal surgeries before. Once we took these adhesions down, we did notice that it helped to broaden the mesentery, which is also one of the important steps of a LADS procedure. That's our staple line from our appendectomy. So again, it was helping us to identify the colon and the small bowel. So once we completed our lysis of adhesions, we placed the small bowel on the right um, and the colon in the left upper quadrant. And following this, we again, we're trying to ensure broadening of the mesentery. Um, so the patient tolerated the procedure well. He was admitted for observation and was discharged on post-operative post day one, tolerating a regular diet. He was seen in clinic for his post-operative appointment about two weeks following surgery and was tolerating a regular diet and having no further episodes of abdominal pain or vomiting. Thank you for, again, allowing me to present. I'd be happy to take any questions.